Wow, what an honor and privilege it is to be on this panel. I'm definitely not deserving of this at this moment, but I'm grateful nonetheless. So I just want to really quickly thank the women on the panel because without them, there's no me um, right now. So I really appreciate one round of applause for these incredible women. Um, and especially Carol, your work in domestic um, violence and trafficking savings so that I do as well. So like, that is that is so great to hear. Um, so I figured I would spend a few minutes today kind of talking about my experience so far in running for office. And then um, I sat down today and I thought about the lessons that we've learned in the close to a year that we've been running. And yeah, we've been running for almost a year. We've been started in August. We started really early. And as you know, the uh, race um, is in November. Um, so there's a unique set of challenges that anyone confronts when running for office, but I think they're made more unique right now. Um, not only because I'm a woman, but because I am a Republican running in the uh, Trump era. Um, and women leadership, though, is needed now more than ever. We know, and as I work, I work, do a lot of work with the United Nations, uh, we know that by any indicator, economic, social, quality of life, societies are better when women are in power, when women are in office. Just as Rwanda, right? It's the fastest growing economy in Africa. It overcame massacres beyond description, you know, and, and there's 80% women now in office, and that's how they did it. 80% of their legislator are women. That's incredible. That's why they're booming. That's the absolute only reason. So we need to get women into office. Um, and there's a huge deficit of leadership here in Manhattan right now. I'm not sure if you're aware, there are 51 seats on our city council. Does anybody know how many women there are? 13, yeah. There's 13 women down from 18 the last electoral cycle. Four term limited, that leads nine. If we don't reelect those women or elect more women like myself to office. We have a significant and serious deficit of female leadership, and that's not representative of New York. There's even less millennials. There's only eight people under 35. And knowing a few of them, I reckon they probably won't win this time around. So now we're talking about a serious deficit of millennial leadership and a serious deficit of female leadership. And that's a problem in a city like New York, where we have a burgeoning millennial population and an enormous amount of women who live and thrive in the city. Um, and I think that the biggest problem is, is that the next greatest generation of leadership haven't even thought about running for office yet. It takes, uh, according to the 21 and 21 campaign, it takes a woman seven times to be asked before she runs. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm unique. When the GOP asked me to run, I didn't even let them finish their sentence. I said yes. <laughs> they didn't even finish. I 100% of it. Um, how do we get women to want to respond that way? And that's something that I would kind of throw out to the audience and hope maybe that you'll think about um, during the course of the evening and, and let me know, because I, I don't have a good answer for that question yet. So um, I figured I'd break down my few minutes into three kind of major points. My, my, my experience in this race and the technical and personal side. Um, and then the kind of lessons learned um, throughout it. So on the technical end, start early. There's, there is an enormous amount of paperwork. There's an enormous amount of back end stuff that you need to do. I would reckon that you should put aside two to three months to prepare to run for office. Not only the amount of paperwork you have to do, you have to open up uh, campaign accounts, you have to start websites, social media, you have to gather a team, you have to put into place essentially what is a company, uh, when you start operating because you're raising money um, here in the city. And, and it's a significant amount of background work. And the one thing you don't want to be doing is running for office while trying to run for office. You have to get that stuff out of the way first so you can focus on your job, which is sharing your message, meeting voters, raising money, and winning that seat. Um, build a really diverse team. Don't assemble the choir that you're preaching to. I said to my best friend and campaign manager, Jared Alper, who's here with us tonight, who's both my rock of Gibraltar, um, the luckiest and most unlucky guy in the world, <laughs> I, I would say. Um, but you know, I said to him, whatever we do, I do not want to hire a team of Republicans. I don't want to hire a team of Republicans. I don't want a whole bunch of Republicans on my team. I want anything but Republicans. I know what my Republicans think. I am one of them, uh, for whatever you may think about that, uh, fortunately or unfortunately right now. Um, and, and you know, find people who are diametrically opposed to you and get them on your team. And I'll give you a great example. I have a friend of mine who is a card-carrying communist. He loves socialism. He's from Europe. He's from Denmark. He's a proud socialist, member of his socialist chapter in, in Copenhagen. He loves his socialism. And we put him on the team. 
because I wanted to cry and craft arguments that would at the very least get him to say, all right, well, you know, I can maybe talk to you about that, or maybe I can meet you halfway on that. And in some cases, we've even got him to say, mm, that might be a better idea than what we do on my end of the, of the ideal, ideological spectrum. Um, so that, I think that's one of the most critical things that we learned when we were, when we were getting um, our team together. Fundraising. This is critical. Don't, don't fool yourself. It doesn't matter how good your message is, how many people know who you are, uh, how much media time you get. If you don't have money, your message will not break past certain barriers at certain points in the races. It is the echo effect that you need to push yourself forward. And you need to focus on how you're going to get that money in there. It's not everything, because if your message is good, money will come in. But I promise you, not all of it. Um, some of your issues, like you're an L1 law student going to class with Alan Dershowitz, right? You need to know your stuff inside and out. And it's not because people are asking questions because they want to know what you think. They're asking questions because they already have an entrenched position. They know the issue area inside and out. They want to know whether or not you agree with them. And if you don't, you better have a damn good reason why you don't. And people ask questions only for that purpose. It's either a gotcha or to argue with you. And, and, and try and, and change, your, change your mind on things. Um, so more importantly, I would say be honest if you don't know the answer. I frequently, well maybe not that frequently anymore, but when we started, I would say to people all the time, you know, I don't have a good answer for that question. But what I would like is if you could spend 20 minutes with me after this event, or you could come over to my headquarters, or we could go out to lunch, and you could tell me what it is that I don't know and how I'm going to fix it. Because we're serving the people, and the people are the ones who know what they need, and we need to respond to that. Be inclusive in your approach to voters. I get told all the time, they will never vote for you, don't go talk to them, don't waste your time. All right, fine, they, they may never vote for me, but I can learn a whole lot about the voters that won't vote for me by meeting with those who are never gonna vote for me. I probably learn more from them than I do any other segment. Um, and you know, conventional campaigning will tell you that you know, me going out and spending an enormous amount of time with diehard loyal Democrats is silly, but I'm gonna be honest, it's not. I've had three Democrats change their registration so they could vote with me in the primary. I don't think they're gonna stay Republican, but they certainly want to help me get past that hump, get past that, that obstacle. Um, believe that messaging can be postpartisan. If we tell people that we can find those collaborative spaces, if we truly believe in this millennial movement as post-partisanship, you will find the people, you'll find the Democrats, the independents, the unregistered, who are willing to listen, sit down, and in many cases, join the cause. Um, these people are worth engaging because there is a growing trend, and it's not just among uh, millennials, it's among all people. They want to see disruptive politics. They want to see change at any cost at any cost. If the president, if Donald Trump presidency hasn't taught us that, then we're missing out on what the lesson is. People are now willing to do anything to see the change that we've been promised for so long. And, and I'll give you an example of that. My, two of my biggest supporters are you know, the MAGA, red hat wearing Donald Trump supporters, and the Birkenstock clad Bernie Bros. They both come out in droves for us. And when I asked my campaign manager why, he said, because you present a disruptive message. You're about disruptive politics. People like it when they hear you say progressive conservative. When you say you're a Republican and you walk into a Democratic room and shake every hand and kiss every baby. People want to see that kind of politics now. So um, and I'll transition a little bit into the, the personal stuff, which is far less glamorous than the campaign trail. Um, at some point, the campaign will become your life. It's just that simple. Um, I obviously work, I go to school, but in the past month or so, I've had to leave work and take a step back. My time spent on my PhD has been significantly less in the, few, the past few weeks, because at some point, if you're not willing to go 100% in on this, you're not going to achieve the goal. So what that means, and Sharon touched upon that, is you have to have a conversation with the people around you. Your family, your partner, your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your pets, your mom, your dad, your boss, whoever it is, you need to tell them that this is going to be an enormous amount of time, it's going to be an enormous amount of stress, it's going to take an enormous amount of work, people are going to say horrible things about you, and the people that you love have to be prepared for that, the same way you are, because if they're not, you're going to see them drop off really quickly. And people will drop off really quickly in your life. It doesn't mean they won't come back. It doesn't mean they don't love you. But I will tell you, politics is not for everybody. 
and you will lose a lot of friends along the way. But you just have to keep the faith that what you're doing is, is the right thing. Um, grow a titanium shell. Not a thick skin, not a second skin. Grow a titanium Ninja Mutant Turtles type shell. Because if not, you are not going to make it past week two. Um, it doesn't matter what I do, what I say, what I wear, who I talk to, where I go, who donates to my campaign, who doesn't donate to my campaign. I'm attacked by the left, by the right, even by unregistered voters. And I, that always gets me crazy. <laughs> but it's true. You know, I've had to defend my age. I'm 34. I've had to defend my gender. I'm, I'm a woman, obviously, up, up here uh, in this panel today. I've had to defend my experience in politics, which is lacking. Um, I've had to defend my relationship status. I'm single. How could a 34-year-old woman be single? Oh, and, you know, uh, all the time. It's my favorite. Favorite question is, why aren't you married? And why is it, would you ask my male counterparts that question? <laughs> no, they won't. Um, I've had to defend my work in the transgender community. Try using the word transness when you walk into a, like a hardcore Republican room. It's crickets. I had to defend my work working with women getting out the life off the track. You know, they, they just don't understand that in certain circles. I've had to defend my, my belief in, in, in broad ranging criminal justice reform, starting with closing Rikers Island, which is an abomination on this city and in our society. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, but you know, but whatever it is, you have to be prepared to defend yourself because apparently no one ever is going to believe that a 34-year-old woman in Manhattan could possibly care more about her job and politics and her school and her charity than she does a relationship with another human being. So you really have to be prepared for that. Um, and I'll, I'll conclude by um, sitting down. I'm uh, sitting down. I don't want to sit down. I'll conclude by telling you some of the thoughts that I had when I sat down today to impart upon you some of the lessons that we've learned. And I tried to. Um, these some micro sound bites that you could carry them with you uh, throughout the rest of the evening. But um, service is an obligation, it's not a choice. So if you're not grateful for the opportunity to lead, don't do it. Uh, politics is a passion, it is not a profession. We don't have a revolving door in the city. We have an open door with a welcome back sign. Don't be part of that problem. Be part of the solution to it. Uh, people will always say it's not your time. But guess what? Ignore them. It's your time. You can do with it whatever you want. Um, be determined. Be resilient. Keep your head down and keep your prayers up to wherever you pray to, whatever that means. There is no end to how far your message will go if it's honest, if it's transparent, and you're pure of intention. That is true. Be idealistic every single morning when you wake up, but practice practicality in everything that you do. Um, have faith in your purpose, but be super passionate about your solutions. And no matter what happens, you always have to do what's right, what's moral, and what's just. Never what's expedient. Because, you know, as Margaret Thatcher, and one of my favorite quotes around the office, and definitely one of my favorite conservatives, tell, tells us that, that if, you're, if you set out to be liked, you would be prepared to compromise on anything at any time and achieve nothing. So um, before I end, and I want to thank the, the panel again for having me, I actually do believe in the bottom of my heart that a single person can change the world when they're inspired and inspiring. I have no doubt of that. And I am so hopeful about the time period that we live in right now because I know that the first female president might be sitting in this room, she might be down the hall, she might be in this building, and I cannot wait for the day that I get to meet her, shake her hand, and say thank you, Madam President. So thank you for having me. I'm running for it. I'm running for city council here in New York, and um, DL and Piper should probably be aware that I'm running for this actual um, this district. Your offices are in my district, so your support is welcome. Thank you. Um, and I will uh, pass along the mic.